Good evening, parents. Good evening, students. I don't know uh, exactly who is who based upon the list, but we're all happy that you are here tonight to our fourth parent university. I'm Adrian Talley, superintendent of Indian Prairie, and I'm so glad that we are able to have this night, this informative night, to help you understand how to pay for college. As I said, this is our fourth uh, uh, parent university, and uh, we are trying to support what our parents need and helping them help their children. I just want everyone to know that on Saturday, March the 4th, from 8 to 12.30 at Matia High School, we are going to have our mental health symposium. This was a postponed symposium. We were gonna have it earlier this year, uh, but we decided to postpone it. And uh, we think this will be an outstanding opportunity for people to gain some additional information related to mental health. We will have various breakout sessions. We have some um, giveaways, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but most importantly, we will have an opportunity to hear from uh, uh, people who know their craft people who um, can help you understand what can be done to support uh, mental health, either mental health for children or mental health for yourselves. So I hope you will come out for this great event. Uh, mental health is something that all of us have to be very concerned about. Uh, mental health is something that we should be supporting. And so this is our, our opportunity to support that for you. So we have uh, two uh, people who will be presenting tonight, Dr. Mark Salisbury, Executive Director of My College Planning Team, and Ms. Erin Hack, Executive Director of High School Services, My College Planning Team. I will say this to, I say this to graduates when I am shaking their hand and asking about their, where they're gonna go to college. I always tell them, go where the money is. <laughs> that is probably the most important thing that you need to consider. Go where the money is because uh, college can be expensive and the more money you can get to pay for it, the better it will be for you. It is a complex um, um, uh, uh, pr process and our, our, tonight our speakers will talk about it and help you walk you through it. So I'm going to turn it over to the two of them. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Talley. Thank you for that warm welcome. Uh, my name is Erin Hack. I'm the Director of High School Services at my college planning team. Um, I am one of the speakers this evening. In just a moment, I'll be introducing you to my co-host. Um, I am also a high school counselor here in the western suburbs of Chicago. So thank you again for joining Parent University and my college planning team for how to pay for college. Our goal tonight is to give you some really great information on what you can do to make college as affordable as possible, both through financial strategies, as well as through academic strategies. And also we'll talk about ways to really improve the college search and the application process for your student. What we are really going to emphasize tonight is that you can't have one without the other. And what do I mean by that? Well, we could give you all of the best financial advice possible, but if you don't have the right fit college, it will end up costing you more money in the long run. And we definitely don't want that. So we are here tonight to provide you with both the financial strategies as well as the academic strategies that will help make your college journey both successful and affordable. So let's start with my college planning team and who we are and what we do. We are a team of over 75 academic and financial professionals, and we work together to help families pay for and prepare for college. All of our team members have many years providing college planning support. Some have expertise in admissions, others are experienced college counselors at both public and private high schools all across the country. And we are specialists in financial aid and we also have college financial aid experts. Many of us have won, won awards for exemplary work with students. Several are published and have been quoted in national media outlets such as US News, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes and Inside Higher Ed. My college planning team's mission is to leave no stone unturned to minimize your college cost and to maximize your college value at the right college for your student. To achieve this mission, we provide families with every academic and application support possible. Everything from general application support to help with preparing a list of colleges where to apply. 
SAT and ACT test prep, also support with the college applications and those essays, which we'll be talking about tonight. We provide advice on building your outside interests through extracurriculars and future professional plans, and also to financial advice to allow you to spend the amount that you want on college through cost estimating, optimizing your need-based financial aid, and appealing any award package that you receive. We'll be explaining more about how all of that works as we get into the workshop tonight. So here's tonight's agenda. In just a moment, I'll introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Mark Salisbury, who is a college financial aid expert. He will discuss how to best understand college prices. Then I will be back to provide you with some guidance on your college search, the selection, the scholarship, and the admission process to really help make sure that you understand the best college possible for your student and really how to successfully find a college that's affordable to your family. Near the end of the presentation tonight, we will add a link to the chat box for you to complete a brief survey. Since we can't discuss your personal finances in a public forum, and we are limited to an hour tonight, please just know that we are always happy to answer your personal questions in a private meeting at a later time. For attending the webinar tonight, you are able to schedule a free conference with one of our team members who will answer all of your questions about pursuing higher education, both academic and the financial sides. So before diving into the details of how to pay for college, I think it's important to really understand how the system works. The fact of the matter is that college admissions is a marketplace. The goal of the college is to generate as much revenue as possible from the students that they enroll. The goal of the consumer, however, the families, is to pay as little as possible to the college in which they enroll. So now I would like to introduce you to Dr. Mark Salisbury. He is the executive director of my college planning team, founder of tuitionfit.com, college financial aid expert, and champion of price transparency. Here's Mark. Thank you, Erin. I really appreciate the uh, very kind words and thank you to everybody who's joining us. Um, this is a, a topic that really is very near and dear to my heart, I know Erin's heart, um, because we see what happens when families benefit from this and know what's going on inside this process and what happens when families don't know what they need to know. So if you take anything away from this presentation, I want you to take what Aaron just said. College is college admissions is a marketplace. And in that marketplace, two sides are trying to accomplish two different things. And you're on the consumer side. That really matters for the way you need to think about things. Okay, so let's jump in first with, yeah, kind of a scary graph here, but I think it's really important just to get some context. College sticker prices, you've all heard that they've gone up a lot. This is just to get a sense of how they've gone up in comparison to the co other costs that we're quite familiar with. You can see down at the bottom, things like computers and TVs actually come down in price, but college tuition and fees and right underneath that college textbooks have jumped way faster than the cost of living, the inflation, and that has put a lot of people in a really difficult place. Now, underneath that, these sticker prices going up, underneath that has been this exploding discount rate. And when I say discount rate, you think, well, what college has ever advertised a sale? Well. When I say discount, really what I'm talking about is all of the financial aid and scholarship money that colleges offer, because in reality, that is just them calling their discount something that is a little bit nicer sounding. They're calling it scholarships and financial aid. It's actually them discounting their price to get you to come. And in 1990, half students still paid the sticker price and the average discount was 25%. Now, in 2021, just a couple of years ago, only one out of 10 students paid the sticker price that the college advertised, and the average discount across all colleges was 55%. It's now closer to 60%. So the amount of money that people are actually paying is far less than the sticker prices that we see advertised all over the place. Now, what that also means is that the actual price that students can pay varies dramatically. And for almost any given student, 
The first year of college can cost as little as $5,000. It can cost as much as $85,000. And it's not too far away that there's going to be a school where their sticker price is over $100,000. Students can pay anything in between there. And the factors that dictate what price you end up paying, they really can sit into three categories. First, it's the college's interpretation of your family's financial need. The college is going to come up with an interpretation of that need, and they're going to interpret it through their lens. So their version of your financial need might not match up with your sense of your financial need. But that's one of the factors colleges use. The second factor colleges use is their interpretation of students' academic merit. And we've seen how that interpretation has shifted over the last several years as a whole wave of colleges decided to make the standardized tests optional. So now they're interpreting academic merit differently than they did before because they have different data. And then number three, how badly the college wants your student and your money. And another way to frame that is the which college you choose, which colleges you choose to look at, which colleges you choose to apply to, that is a dramatic factor in dictating the actual price you end up paying. So with that said, that means that you really have to end up thinking about both a financial plan and an academic plan and get those to weave together to end up with the best college, best possible college outcome. So let's tackle that first part of this. How do we minimize college price? Whatever college we choose to go to. And remember I said before, it will matter which colleges you choose to pursue, to think about, to visit, to ultimately apply to. That will be one of the factors that dictate the price you end up paying. But let's go a little bit beyond that, a little bit deeper than that. First of all, these are the things that people say all the time when they ask, well, how are you going to pay for college? There's a long list of things, right? They say, well, you know, current, current income, right? Of course, except for if anybody like most of us, we don't have that kind of income laying around. You might think, well, we're going to dip into retirement. We'll just take from retirement and we'll figure it out later. Um, and that can actually be one of the worst possible strategies. And we'll talk a little bit about why. You have a college savings account. There's some of those. Those are great. Um, it's hard to get those uh, numbers to the level that would pay for all of your kids. But you might be able to use some of those strategies. Some people just rely on borrowing and borrow as much as it takes. And unfortunately, we have a whole generation of people now who know that that was not such a great strategy. Some people will say, well, we'll win private scholarships. And yes, there's lots and lots of private scholarships out there. But the average price of the average amount of a private scholarship is maybe a thousand, two thousand dollars. You'll need a whole bunch of those to pay the cost of going to college, even if it's the average actual price of like a $30,000 actual price. You, it's not just going to be one private scholarship that'll do that. And then the last one is to win aid from the colleges themselves. And you know what? That's where the largest chunk of scholarship money is coming from, is from the colleges themselves in the form of the discounts that we just mentioned. But all of those are possibilities now trying to figure out how do you navigate all of that, you need to understand a couple of things. You need to dive into a couple of, couple of things that are really important. And the number one thing to start with, first things first, pick a price range. Pick a price range for you, for your family, for your student, and stick to it. And you're actually allowed to do that. There's a lot of people that say, well, college is, well, it's, you just got to pay whatever it takes. Well, we now know that for a lot of people who tried that, that outcome was not so good. So for starters, remember, pick a price range. And then secondly, identify the colleges that fit your price range and stick to it. You're allowed to do that too. Remember the range of prices I told you about from 5,000 to 85,000 and everything in between? 
there are all kinds of colleges that offer prices all over the place in the middle there. And then even at individual colleges, those prices are all over the place. And if you know how to find the information, and we'll talk a little bit about that today, you can identify the colleges that fit that price range. The biggest thing I want you to think about is stick to that list. This marketplace, the colleges want you to make emotional decisions. They want you to swoon over their fancy facilities and new buildings and world-class faculty, whatever phrase they want to use. They want you to do that. Why? Because when you make emotional decisions, you pay more. You want to make a rational decision. You want to make the right decision that's best for your student and best for your family and not swoon and fall for something, right? This is one way to ensure that you're going to make a rational decision. Pick a price range and stick to it and then find the colleges that fit that price range and stick to it. Okay. Now, <laughs> some of you know what this thing is. Everyone calls about the FAFSA. Some of you might not. So I'm going to back up just a quick second. But I know all of you have the same facial expression on your faces that these two, this young couple has, just excited to hear about some acronym that you don't know what it is. The FAFSA, it's called the FAFSA. You'll hear lots of people say FAFSA or they'll pronounce it differently and who cares? It's the free application for federal student aid. It's run by the Department of Education and it is one of the tools that dictate, one of the things that then dictate part of how colleges decide your price. So I'm gonna give you just a little bit of information on the FAFSA. If your student is already a senior, you probably encountered this and hopefully you filled it out. If your student's a junior or younger, this is something that is in your future. So knowing a little bit about it now might help. First of all, it comes out every year, October 1st, most years. It's possible next year that they're actually going to hold it until January because, and I will talk about this in a second, legislation was passed a couple of years ago that will change the FAFSA in a couple of pretty important ways. And it turns out that the Department of Education is having a really hard time making sure all those changes are in place by October 1st of 2023. Shocking. Okay, maybe. But know that it's comes out when it comes out and it's really important to complete it early. Complete it earlier than later. Now, the second thing is that you're gonna have to fill this out every year. You have to update it yearly because it is using information from your tax returns and your financial situation to dictate one part of the calculus that decides your price. And that is the interpretation of your family financial situation. The outcome of the FAFSA formula, after you plug in some information and you link it to your tax returns, that thing's called the expected family contribution. And now that I have told you what it is, it's going to be renamed next year. So when someone says student aid index, that's the same thing as the expected family contribution. It's just being renamed a new thing. The formula, it's been around for decades. And the premise here is that it will tell the colleges about what your family ought to be able to pay for college. Somebody asked a question, when you fill it out, can you fill it out as a freshman? I'm assuming you mean freshman in high school. No, you only fill this out as a senior in high school for your student planning to go to college the next year. And then you'll fill it out at the end of the freshman year in college and the sophomore year each year until your student's going all the way through school. All right. Now, it's a terrible formula. It just is, but it's the one that the, co that the colleges use because the federal government uses it. And it's, so it's a proxy that everybody gets stuck with to estimate somebody's financial need or another way of thinking about it is their family's financial situation. So the result of this fun little formula, this fun little form called the FAFSA is the EFC. And a lot of people tend to think, and it's not unreasonable to think this, that you're sort of just stuck with what you got, right? You get what you get and you don't throw a fit. I think that's one of my school counselors used to say that. 
But in fact, you have some control over your EFC. You can actually organize your family finances in such a way that your EFC is going to look balloon a little high. And you can organize your fa family finances so that your EFC comes out maybe more realistically. Now, it doesn't, it's not a magic bullet. You can't just solve anything with it, but it is something you can do. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So let's talk about what goes into the EFC, what, what the information you're going to put on to the FAFSA when you fill that out. International students, by the way, don't apply for the FAFSA. This is just for domestic students. And I should say uh, citizens, American citizens, right? So if you're international, but you still have American citizenship, you can still apply for, use this document. But there's three kinds of categories of assets, if you will, or money that go into this. One is, well, first of all, just what your family income is. And then I'll say that at the bottom, I put who earns that income. That's an information piece that's relevant and can play out in different ways. We'll talk about that in a second. But then there's also the kinds of assets that you own as a family, the types of assets that you own, and then who in the family actually owns those assets. Those are the things that are going to shape the EFC. Okay. Now, just when I was telling you about the EFC, I should probably tell you there's actually two versions of what gets you to the EFC. The reason I want to tell you about this that's so important is that it just goes to show how this stuff, how these different formulas get used by colleges to essentially justify the price they're going to ask you to pay. So there's the FAFSA that I just mentioned. That's the sort of core way to do all this. That's the way you apply for, qualify for a Pell Grant. That's the way you fill out that form to get awarded any of the federal financial loans that they might give up. But then there's a subset of schools that say, you know what, that information is just not enough. We want to know more. And so they will ask you to fill out something called the CSS profile. And that dives even deeper into your family finances. So let's look at the difference between the two. The FAFSA, the federal methodology, it's going to ask you basic questions about your income and some other questions about assets. But it won't ask you about untaxed income. It won't ask you about contributions from grandparents, home equity, a couple of other things. It doesn't ask for that. So that stuff, they just leave that alone. But the CSS profile, when you get to that one, they do ask for this stuff. So they ask for a bunch of different things. The institutional methodology from the CSS profile will also ask, trying to get our slides to kick forward here. They'll ask about non-custodial parents' assets. They'll ask about home equity. They'll ask about other assets and some business assets. They will ask about a whole host of things that aren't asked for in the FAFSA. And with the result of that is that for most families, when you fill out the, when you go to a school, want to go to a school that asks for the CSS profile, the EFC at that school is going to be a lot higher than the EFC at a school that just asked for the FAFSA. This is what we mean when we're talking about how one way to minimize your costs, minimize the cost of college. One of them is know a little bit about what your EFC is going to be, depending on whether you just fill out the FAFSA or you do the FAFSA and the CSS profile. And there's ways to do that. You can Google EFC calculator or EFC estimator, and you'll find a whole bunch of them online that will allow you to run these things and test and see, huh, what would that number be? And so if you've got a student that's a junior or sophomore or younger, not a bad idea to do that just to get a sense of this. All right. So what does all this then mean? All right. There are strategies that you can employ to shape how your EVC plays out. In addition to deciding, do I want to go to a school that asks for a CSS profile or do I want to go to a school that asks just for the FAFSA? So it's a couple of these strategies that have turned out to be really helpful for people. There is what's called an income protection allowance for students. And under that amount, if your student makes under that amount in a year as a part-time job, 
then that doesn't have to get mentioned or thought about in the in the FAFSA. But students can actually make a lot of money these days doing gig work, doing other things. And it's not unusual for a student's income in a given year to jump over that income protection allowance. And now all of a sudden that's money that the schools say, oh, we'll take that, thank you very much. So keep the student's income under the protection allowance. The second thing is capital gains, right? If you take capital gains in the years where you're gonna be filling out a FAFSA, your income will jump right? And that will matter because then the college will say, oh, that looks like this family has got more money to spend and they should be spending it on college. So don't take those capital gains in those years. If you have the ability to do so, if you have the uh, influence to do so, and keep work hard, get your bonuses, but find a way to postpone those bonuses, right? Keep those out of your ecosystem, your financial ecosystem while your student's in college. And then lastly, take advantage of the opportunity to make charitable contributions when you're filling out, when the years are that you're filling out the FAFSA and your kids are in college, because those will help to bring down your EFC. Now, we talked about assets that are tracked and paid attention to in the FAFSA and the CSS profile, and then assets that are not. Really important to understand this stuff. There's accessible assets, meaning the things that the FAFSA takes into account and says, oh, they've got more money to pay, on pay for college. Bunch of money in savings, stocks and mutual funds, bonds, custodial accounts. Some of the things that we mentioned here, um, these are things that are going to show up and people are going to, the FAFSA is going to say, well, you've got this money, you should spend it, right? And it's important to know that you can actually move some of this money around so that you can keep your EFC down, okay? In By comparison, let's talk about non-assessable assets. Retirement accounts don't show up in the FAFSA. You don't pay attention to that stuff. So, if you have a bunch of money that you've put aside for retirement and it's just sitting in a money market account versus putting it in a 401k, that's one way you can move money around to lower your EFC. Remember, we talked about this a second ago, home equity, it's not something that the FAFSA pays attention to, but the CSS profile does. So it's really important to keep that in mind. And just to make it even more complicated, of the colleges that take the CSS profile, some of them assess home equity at different levels, just because, you know, we want to make it fun. Some annuities can be non-assessable. And if you have cash value held in a life insurance policy, that's also non-assessable. Okay. So I mentioned this a bit ago, and this is important to know that you've heard about this maybe that there was gonna be this overwhelming positive impact for students is FAFSA Simplification Act, Simplification Act 2021. Here's the good stuff, I guess. That term expected family contribution, it had a whole bunch of values loaded into it, right? We expect you to put this money forward. And then what has happened is people are, lots of middle-class and upper middle-class Americans are in positions where they don't have anything close to the kind of money that would be able to meet that expected family contribution. So they changed the name to student aid index. We'll take it, right? Like it's not a huge bonus, but we'll, okay, we'll take it. They limited income assessment to income, limited some of the income items in your tax return. So those things don't play out. There's now, that they used to say like, if there's a grandparents making a contribution, we're gonna pay attention to that. Now that stuff doesn't get into the equation at all. So. 529s in grandparents' names don't have to be mentioned, don't have to be listed. Whereas if your student has a 529 and it's in their name, they're the owner of it, then that has to go on the FAFSA. And then they increase the Pell Grant by a bit. Not a ton, but a bit. And today, you know, every dollar counts. But the negative stuff isn't so great here. It used to be, well, let's start with the first one because it's, it used to be there was some wiggle room when you're divorced or separated parents and you're filling out the FAFSA, you're doing it 
on the basis of one of the two family member fa parents um, financial situation. And it, there was a little bit of wiggle room there as to which parent you decided to base the FAFSA on. Now there's a bit more control there. And they're saying like, you got to have it with the parent that the student lives with the most. And that there's, they're kind of coming down on that. Remember with the CSS profile, they actually go and find, they want to know about the custodial asset, the assets of both parents, non-custodial parent and custodial parent. So that always tends to play out in not so comfortable ways for divorce families that are still trying to figure out how to pay for college together. The EFC used to pay attention to, if you had multiple kids in college at the same time, you got a discount on your EFC. They eliminated that entirely, no grandfather, no grandfather clause at all, just cold turkey, we're going to switch it. They're talked about how that's not going to matter that much for people. Don't worry. Ha. Okay. I'll trust you later. But right now I'm skeptical. And then the last one is that they eliminated the small business exemption exclusion. It used to be that if you owned a small business, you could organize your money in such a way that um, all of the money that you might have had in a salary now is organized in small business and that could be excluded. They've changed that now entirely. So that is a change that if you have a small business, you want to pay attention to that. And there's things you can do to get around that, that we could talk about in a free conference. I know I've talked about, by the way, a bunch of different things that are unique to different families. And you probably all have lots of questions that are specific to you. This is what the free conference is for, just so you know, the chance to actually ask questions about your specific situation, because it would not be appropriate for us to start talking about somebody's particular situation here in a public setting. So. Just to say that. Now, let me, before I hand this over to Aaron, I just want to talk through six of the biggest mistakes that people make when they're thinking about how they're going to pay for college. And the first one I just mentioned, but keeping savings in the child's name means that you're reporting all of that money into the FAFSA and it's all getting counted that increases your EFC. Take that same money and put it in somebody else's name. If you got a grandparent, an uncle that you trust, do that because it will help you a lot. The second thing is when people talk about taking from their retirement funds to pay for college, two things happen. When you take from the retirement, you pay for penalty unless you're old enough that you can squeeze by, you're close enough to retirement. But otherwise you're paying a penalty to take that money out of retirement. And by the way, then you don't have as much money in retirement. But then also, because you've taken that money, it's boosted your income on your, your tax return. And therefore, it looks like you got more money to pay for college. And so your EFC goes up. So don't take from retirement. Families swoon over colleges all the time. And, you know, we're all emotional and we like beautiful places. I get it. But families focusing on colleges that are just outside their price range and then just thinking we'll figure it out later over and over and over, this ends up being a huge mistake for them. Next, we talked about it a little bit, but there are ways you can organize your finances to reduce your EFC. Not necessarily just get it to zero, but get it to where it's as close to realistic as possible. There's a process that folks have, have sort of known about, I think, for a long time, but just assumed that they wouldn't do it, which is called the appeals process. And it used to be something that colleges didn't have to think about because there were way more students that wanted to come than there were spots for them. But now that has changed dramatically. And this process of appealing for more financial aid can and often does result in an increase in your financial aid. The most recent data, 73% of the families that asked for more money got it. Crazy though. Only 40% of the families actually asked. Well, that's kind of because they just didn't know. That's why I'm telling you. You got to take care, take advantage of that process. And then lastly, as you probably can tell, not starting early. It's too easy to just kick this can down the road and ignore it and pretend it won't be a problem. Don't do that. Wherever you are right now, start now. 
Um, well, thank you, Mark. Every time I listen to you, I feel like I learned something new about this financial aid process. So thank you for bestowing your wisdom um, upon everyone here. And I just think it's incredible. So now that we've heard all about the financial side of college planning, I would like to switch gears a bit. I'm going to be giving you a lot of information tonight on academic strategies for achieving college success. If you have any questions based on what I'm talking about this evening, please add them in the chat box. And again, we will answer those for you. Um, please know that my college planning team is always happy to answer your personal questions one-on-one, -on -one, over the phone, um, or via Zoom. We know that a lot of the personal questions aren't things that you'd like to add in the chat box. Um, so please know that there is a link in the chat box for you to sign up for a free conference if you'd like to have those questions answered privately. So I was so happy today when I was looking through the list of all of the registrants um, who signed up to attend this evening, and I saw so many early college planners on that list. Um, even many elementary and middle school families are here tonight who are really eager to get a jump start on the college planning process. We here at my college planning team firmly believe that it is in your best interest to begin this process early. And why is that? Well, because a student's academic plan and the courses that they need to take in high school need to be coordinated, not just to meet the state's minimum for graduation requirements, but also to prepare them for college. And a student's outside interests and extracurriculars really need to blend into their academic focus and major in college and ultimately into their professional plans. And that takes a lot of time to develop naturally. And then on the financial side, as we said, few people can simply pay for college right out of their paycheck. So savings and financial planning really needs to fit into the whole process. And of course, that can't all be done last minute either. When you leave this until really late in the junior year or even early senior year, as a counselor, I see this all the time. It can be a very stressful process for both the student and the family. And this is one where the earlier choices that you've made really can't be changed by that point. So this really shouldn't be a crash course. It should be a set of really reasoned steps that are taken over time to build a happy future. So given all of these factors and choices to consider, as well as the fact that there are over 3,000 colleges in the United States, how do you begin the search? Well, I will say that it has to begin with you, the student and the family. It is super important that the student really thinks about themselves and what they want from college. These are fit factors, how a given college matches up with a student. We've been emphasizing college finances and costs earlier, but it's really important to extend that outlook and pay attention to value. That's what you're getting from spending the time and your money on college. So make sure that an undergrad program really delivers a valuable education and experience to your student. And that begins with fit. So finding the right fit college for you or your, for your students really does depend on these several factors of fit that you see here on the screen. We all know that cost is very important. And that's why Mark shared that information with you first tonight. As he explained, college costs, they vary widely from college to college. So it's really imperative to dig deep into each college's merit and need-based aid. Besides financial fit, there are five other factors of fit to hone in on with your students. So let's go through those. First is support. How a college assists students with academics is an important factor in what kind of education that your student is gonna be getting at college. Some students um, will need a lot more support from their college. Some schools offer little support because they want your student to foster uh, an environment of independence. And then there's other schools who will offer an in-depth support system, things like free tutoring groups and also even writing assistance. So really think about your child's learning style. Do they require more support and professor interaction to be successful? Or do they prefer a large lecture hall where maybe they are one of 500 students with a lot more anonymity? Next would be thinking about what environment best fits your student. Whether it's a small school in the middle of a large city or a university that makes up most of a small town, really choosing your school should go beyond the campus. There are benefits to small and large campus communities, so you'll want to do your research to really find out what it's like to live there. Does your student want to be near to home or do they want to be far away? Is this part of a permanent move to a new state? Or do they want to attend a school where they regularly run into their high school classmates? 
All of these factors need to be considered as you're researching colleges and then narrowing down that list of best fit colleges for applications. Third, this is determining what is socially and culturally important for your student. Finding colleges that meet their personal and their social fit, uh, it's extremely important to their overall happiness and really their ability to stick with the college for four years and to get the most value out of their college experience. One of the best ways, in my opinion, to really determine that social and cultural fit is through on-campus visits. This way, your student can experience that campus life firsthand. During the tour, we encourage students to ask questions about what kinds of activities, facilities, and resources are available to students, attending a class, speaking with students, and even extended campus visits are all ways to further determine the social and cultural fit for your student. Fourth, check out internship opportunities. Having experience in your field that your student is interested in is not only valuable for future careers, but also a really great way to discover their passions and to expand their network. Check out the internships, hands-on experience, research, and those study abroad opportunities that the schools offer. And then academic matters. Last, but certainly not least, really ensure that the college is not only strong in your child's intended major, but that they have a good graduation rate and a good job placement rate for that major. Knowing what the school's placement rates are for jobs and also for postgraduate schools is really going to be critical to consider because I think it gives you an indication about the success and the depth of each program. The second strategy is investing in improving standardized test scores, which can really pay off in dividends for your child in the long run. Test scores aren't just used for admission purposes. A good score can really help reduce your overall cost by helping a student qualify for more financial aid. It can sometimes qualify you for specialized admission into certain fields of study, things like engineering or business and even nursing. And if there are perhaps some weaknesses in your student's high school GPA, a good SAT score or ACT score can really bolster a college's confidence in you for admission. So even though this year over 80% of colleges are test optional for admission, we are starting to see a trend with more colleges requiring them again in the post-COVID world. Students today often apply for more than eight colleges their senior year. So their college list is likely to be one that's going to be required submitting a test score, an SAT or an SAT, SAT or ACT test score. I will say that many students find a lot of benefit from some type of SAT or ACT test prep. Although the ultimate goal of test prep is a higher score, good programs cover a subset of objectives that cumulatively yield better results. This subset includes everything from whether a student is best served by taking the SAT or the ACT, how to elevate those multiple choice questions and really evaluate them, um, also the academic knowledge and skills that it takes to be successful on one of those standardized tests, and then also helping through things like test anxiety and also focus during the test. It's important to note that standardized test prep is not a miracle solution. I really wish it was. It can't raise an 1100 combined SAT score to say a 1400, but our tutors really see repeatable and routine significant improvements in results. There are many great options out there um, from the free self-paced ConAcademy.com to more personalized tutoring services that can be one-on-one -on -one test prep or even group test prep offerings. Number three is showing demonstrated interest in your top colleges. Most colleges will prioritize applications when they know that the student is genuinely interested in them. And believe me when I say that colleges have increasingly significant, really significant and sophisticated ways of knowing when that interest is real. They track everything. And I've learned this as a school counselor firsthand. So one of the important ways to really demonstrate a real interest in the institution is by signing up for and attending an online event or a campus visit. Colleges collect and they track that sort of information, so none of it is forgotten or ignored. 
Events in person um, really will give your student the opportunity to connect with an admissions officer who may one day also be the person who is reviewing their application for admission. When we do, when you do the, one of those campus visits, a big recommendation here is to make sure that you're collecting the names of the folks that you're speaking with on campus, um, because that is someone whose name you might need to contact down the road. And then also, last but not least, some colleges nowadays are offering scholarships just for visiting the campus. For example, Western Illinois University offers a great $1,000 Leatherneck scholarship per year, okay, $1,000 renewable for four years, just for visiting the campus. So there's some great opportunities out there and I really encourage you to dig around on the admissions page as you are scheduling your on-campus visit um, to make sure that you're taking advantage of those opportunities. Speaking of scholarships, I can tell you that at many high schools, scholarships are completely under applied for. Every year, there are many scholarships out there that are advertised and no one applies for them and they go unclaimed. It breaks my heart as a school counselor when we get a call back from a, from a scholarship agency and they say they didn't receive any applications. It breaks my heart because it's free money. So you might be wondering, why is that? Why aren't kids applying? Well, I will say that a lot of these scholarships are maybe for $500 or $1,000. And what I hear from my students is that they don't want to spend the hour or so that it takes writing the required essay for the scholarship application. So please tell your students that applying for scholarships, it's like a job once they get to their senior year and it will pay off in the long run. There are a good number of really good online resources to help you identify scholarships. First, I definitely recommend checking out your high school counseling page. Usually that's where you're going to find all of the local scholarships. As far as the national scholarship, scholarships, the big search engines, I, a really good one in my opinion is fastweb.com. It's a great scholarship search engine where students can enter their profile information and they are matched with scholarships. I recommend that during junior year, have your students sign up on fastweb.com, create their profile, and then have them download the app on their phone so that they'll be sent a notification for every scholarship that they qualify for. So fastweb.com is just one of the good sites. I can have Julian and Mark also add some other great scholarship sites to the chat box right now so that you can write those down as well. Here's an important inside tip regarding scholarships. As you're researching colleges, be sure to ask the Office of Financial Aid, what is their stance on private scholarships? While most colleges will allow students to use those to pay down the unmet need, others will only reduce student loans. About a quarter of all colleges, however, will actually reduce the grant money for which the student is eligible and the amount equal to the private scholarship. And what that's called is scholarship displacement. That means that the family essentially receives zero value for all of the hours of hard work that they put into winning one of those scholarships. It's really important to know about this policy as you apply to college and as you're accepting those admissions off offers. So next, let's talk about writing an application essay. And I think this information is helpful as well um, regarding scholarships. A lot of people ask me, what's something that I can do to help make myself more eligible for scholarships and to really catch the eye of a scholarship committee? Well, the same thing goes for an admissions committee, and that's writing an outstanding essay. At highly competitive colleges, all students are going to look the same on paper. All students who apply to Northwestern, Notre Dame, Yale, and Harvard, they all have great GPAs. They've all got great test scores. They're all doing tons of extracurriculars. The college admissions essay is what's going to give the admissions officers a different perspective on the applicant beyond their academic achievements, beyond those test scores and their extracurriculars. It's your student's chance to really stand out from other applicants with similar academic profiles by telling unique, personal, and specific stories about themselves. Please tell your student to take the time to write an outstanding essay, even if it's optional. If your student is on the cusp of admission, writing a great essay is what can help them get into their dream school. Now that all colleges are really reviewing these applications much more holistically, it is more important than ever for your student to write an outstanding essay. When looking at the top colleges in the United States, 
Data shows that that admission essay accounts for 25% of the student's overall application, which is only slightly behind extracurriculars, which are at 30%. Next, encourage your student to start writing their college essay early, no later than the summer before their senior year of high school. That way they have ample time to think about the prompt and to really craft the best personal statement possible. Regardless of the age of your student, have them check out the Common App essay prompts. Okay, that's on Common App, you can Google it. Um, because what they can do is they can look at these prompts, they don't change much from year to year, and they can begin to formulate a plan for which prompt will guide their personal essay. Next, make sure that the essay makes your student shine. It's important that they are authentic, that they really write with the reader in mind and they focus on deeper themes. Please don't rehash extracurriculars. Those are already included in the application. College admissions officers are interested in learning more about your student and really what makes them tick. And then finally, the essay should be flawless. An applicant with a low GPA can improve their chances of getting into college with a strong personal statement. On the other hand, an applicant with excellent grades could get rejected because of a poorly written essay. We encourage students to write several drafts read it out loud, and then make revisions. Afterward, I do recommend that students have their essay reviewed by their English teacher and also by their school counselor who can provide really valuable insight on the essay's quality because they understand what those college admissions officers are looking for in the essay. A well-crafted essay could be the deciding factor in your student's favor. To truly assess an applicant's fit with the school, admissions officers need the essays. Essays are really your students' one opportunity to share their voice, their unique experiences, and also their perspective. Another valuable academic strategy is taking college classes ahead of time. This can help you test out of introductory courses when you arrive on campus. It might ultimately reduce the cost of a college degree by allowing you to graduate early or for you to take more advanced classes while you are an undergraduate, getting more value out of the program. Ask your high school counselor about dual credit offerings at your high school. Oftentimes, these classes are the same ones that freshmen will take on campus and you will pay pennies on the dollar for the exact same credits by taking it at your high school as part of the normal class schedule. Another option are college level exam program courses. Those are called CLEPS. These are offered by the College Board, which is the same company that runs AP. The CLEP program enables students to earn college credit for introductory level courses by taking subject specific tests. Nearly 3,000 colleges across the US accept these CLEP based uh, tests and that as long as they are administered in a test center. So definitely Google CLEP and check that out to see if it would be a good option for your student. This slide shows you other options and some sites where you can learn more, such as Outlier and modernstates.org. And our final academic strategy for reducing college cost is to graduate with a bachelor's degree in four years. So let's go over some strategies regarding college persistence that I think every family needs to be aware of. First, out of all high school graduates who enter college as freshmen, 26% of them do not return for their sophomore year. That's almost a third of the freshman class that doesn't return every year. They drop out of college for reasons that might be financial or personal or academic. Next, 37% of students transfer from one college to another. The ultimate result of all of this turbulence and change is that 44%, less than half, graduate with a bachelor's degree in the scheduled four-year time frame which ends up costing you more money. So are you ready for this? Here's the national average on how long it really takes nowadays to get a bachelor's degree. Nearly six years. I know you're likely thinking, why is it taking so long? Let's take a look. Students might drop out of college for reasons that might be financial, personal, or academic. They can't handle the schoolwork, they arrive on campus and they are unhappy, they might even hate it, or they are doing fine, but they drop out because they can't afford the college that they've decided to attend. These are just a few reasons why we at My College Planning Team focus so strongly on helping students and families find the right fit well in advance. 
Now I'm going to put on my admissions counselor hat here for just a moment. And I wanna talk a little bit about what colleges are really looking for in your application. First, achievements. Of course, we want to know your GPA, your test scores, but we also really wanna know the rigor of your classes. Did you take a few AP or college dual credit classes? Or did you take the easy way to get your GPA? How did you challenge yourself academically? And are you ready for the rigor of college classes? Next would be experience. What are you involved in? Sports, music, drama, mathletes? Do you do community service? Do you have a job? That shows your student is an excellent multitasker. Do they have responsibilities at home? Um, in short, how does your student contribute to the community in which they belong? And then motivation. We need to know in some cases, regardless of your grades, what motivates you to succeed? How do we know that you are serious about college and that you'll be able to excel in our courses and graduate? So now that colleges are taking a much more holistic review of a student's college application, it is more important than ever that your student really shows their strong character by showcasing their achievement, their experience, and their motivation. So in review, here is what a college search done well consists of. First, know who you are and how higher education will help you. Research your colleges well and know what you can afford. Prepare strong applications that bring all of your best to the table and really make informed, wise choices after all the admissions and the financial aid award letters are in. So I know that we just gave you a lot of information to digest and you probably have quite a few questions, that's normal. Let me tell you how we can help you out with that. Many of the points made in our presentation are general truths, but every student and every family is different and all families have very specific questions about their college careers. We'll be able to help you with these more specific questions in a free conference, either by phone or by video. We're happy to discuss all aspects of the college process from academics to applications to money and how to pay. And we're happy to talk with parents of younger students as you begin to prepare for how to pay for college. So tonight our goal was to give you some really good, helpful, creative ways to reduce your college cost. We've given you a lot of information and now is when we would like to hear from you. We would like for everyone in attendance to please complete just a very brief evaluation of tonight's workshop. And we'll go ahead and paste that in the chat box now. This very brief evaluation is going to give us feedback to ensure that we are helping families like yours as much as possible. So the survey will only take you a minute to complete, but it really does give us very valuable feedback to ensure that we're providing the most relevant, helpful information for families like yours. We'll also share this with your district and with Parent University, um, just so they can see what types of topics were covered this evening and how it helped you as a family to prepare for and to pay for college. And then finally, please be sure to connect with my college planning team on social media and tell your friends about us. Definitely check out our website, which is gomcpt.org for more information about us and our programs and our events. Lastly, you can scan the QR code right there on your screen to sign up for our free monthly college planning newsletter. Our newsletter is called The One Stop College Shop because it really helps you stay on top of what you and your student can be doing during each stage of the college planning process. We break our newsletter down by grade level to make it really specific for you so that you can learn financial aid, college search, and test prep tips relevant to where you are on your college planning journey. Thank you very much. I want to I want to thank our presenters, Dr. Salisbury and Ms. Hack, for the information they gave. I was monitoring the questions. Wonderful questions. Uh, the people just have uh, great questions that I appreciate the answers to. Again, this is a journey that all of you as parents are on, and you cannot start early enough as you are examining this. Um, great suggestions that were given. Uh, we will have our this presentation put on our website so that you will be able to access it. And I look forward to our next parent um, university. Look for information about that soon. Again, to all of you, thank you. Um, uh, to our presenters again, thank you so much and everybody have a wonderful night.